Good morning and thank you for joining us today for the WT Financial Group November Investor Livestream event. I'm Jay Morgan, the Investor and Media Relations Manager, and I am joined by Keith Cullen, the Founder and CEO. Thanks for joining us today, Keith. Yeah, thanks, Jane. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. Wonderful. So the company recently announced the acquisition of Millennium 3 Advice Network from ASX Listed Insignia Financial Limited. So in today's webinar, Keith will be providing a presentation on the acquisition, the outlook for the company, and the advice profession more generally. To ask a question throughout today's webinar, please use the Q&A function, which can be found at the bottom of your screen. But Keith, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, thanks, Jane, and thanks, everybody, for joining us. There we go. All right, well, as Jane says, I, I, what I might start with, actually, is just a little recap on the company for those that, um, that don't know it, and then we'll run through this acquisition that we've announced. And I'll give an update on where the profession's at and where the uh, opportunity is for the profession and our company um, generally. So, Jane, if we could hop through to the disclaimer, and make sure that everybody knows that what we're discussing today is not uh, financial advice. It's general in nature. Um, I think you've probably all seen that uh, before. All right. Well, let's have a look at WTL as a company and how we're structured um, I think the first thing we'd say is really WTL is what I'd call a pure play wealth management and financial advice group. Um, we've got um, two distinct businesses or two distinct divisions in the company, uh, those being our business to business division and our business to consumer division. So the parent company sits at the top and underneath that, uh, our business to business division is made up of what will now be four, but currently is three uh, advice cohorts. These are uh, independently owned and operated advice practices across the country that operate as corporate authorised representatives with their advisors operating as authorised representatives of either our Sentry, our Synchron or our Wealth Today businesses. And the acquisition that we've announced is to pick up another advisor network called Millennium 3. Uh, all of these uh, businesses uh, operate under their own brands, but really they're B2B brands. So uh, the, the, the underlying advice practices themselves will be operating not under one of these brands. They'll be something like, you know, Mary Smith and Associates or, or uh, Sydney Financial Planning and Mortgages. Um, and, the, and then those entities are corporate authorised representatives of these B2B brands of ours. So often the consumers um, uh, are actually oblivious to the fact that um, that we're there um, providing the licensing and all of the supports that the practices need. Whilst we've got the four individual brands, what we've done as we've made these acquisitions is to ensure that we're driving efficiencies and providing all of the same services to all of the advisors, regardless of which cohort they're in, is we've brought everything together under a central support hub that we call Wealth Advisor. And I'll talk more about those different services that we've consolidated under Wealth Advisor. But the way that we've structured the business, that's also given us the opportunity now to take those services out to other licensees. So that would either be practices that hold their own AFSL, um, which is uh, somewhat of a growing market, or other what we would call micro licensees that have small numbers of advisors, but don't have enough scale to deliver a broad range of services. Then finally, we've got our direct to consumer business, which is Spring Financial Group and it delivers services direct to consumers uh, across accounting and tax, financial planning, uh, wealth management, estate planning, and so on. So the Millennium 3 acquisition um, we announced a couple of days ago and is uh, on target to settle in mid-December. And we've agreed to pay Insignia Financial uh, $2 million for the acquisition, and it brings to the group uh, an additional uh, more than 130, 130, 140 advisors that operate across more than 75 practices. And Millennium 3, or M3 as it's known uh, in the marketplace, uh, has been in business around 30 years. So it's got a very proud history, a very well-known uh, group of advisors and, and uh, a terrific cohort of advisors. And we expect uh, the M3 acquisition to, on an annualised basis, once we've got it all integrated in, contribute more than $50 million in revenue, uh, about $4.5 million in GP, and uh, and more than uh, half a million dollars in net profit before tax. So uh, a terrific acquisition for us at what we think is uh, a, a very good uh, price. 
and uh, will certainly be uh, accretive to earnings. One of the exciting parts about the acquisition for us is um, it will be a very seamless transition. So to explain what I mean by that, just having a look at this slide here, Wealth Advisor I mentioned earlier is our centralised support hub. And, and this is what each of Wealth Today, Sentry and Synchron currently plug into. And what's centralised there is the approved product list for the advisors, um, all of the advisor education and training, all of the policy suite that the advice practitioners operate using, uh, all of our consumer engagement and marketing tools that we make available for both the uh, clients of the underlying practices, uh, things like our financial literacy handbooks and manuals, and also our marketing tools, such as our digital marketing tools that we make available to the advisors that are looking to either engage with their existing clients, gain referrals from their existing clients, or drive inbound lead flow and, uh, and client flow. We also centralise uh, our professional indemnity insurance program across the group. Our remuneration management teams operate across the group. Our risk management framework that we operate or what others might call a compliance framework is standardised across the group. And then we offer estate planning services out to each of the cohorts as well from a centralised uh, location. That's legal and estate planning services that they can uh, provide to their clients. So all of the same personnel operating right across uh, all of those key facets of our business. What we have on the front end is our advisor recruitment teams and our practice management and support services that are delivered by our regional managers that um, engage with, uh, with each of the cohorts. So why I say it's going to be a seamless transition is um, Insignia Financial operates on a very similar basis. Uh, so they have uh, multiple brands, uh, including Millennium 3 that we've acquired from them. And they have some uh, client facing uh, staff or advisor facing staff that are that are doing those things like advisor recruitment and the pra assisting practices to grow their revenue and improve their practice management and supporting uh, the practices. But all of those same sorts of services that I've suggested that we offer through our centralised hub is uh, Insignia also runs on a centralised hub basis. And so this, is, this will make the transition uh, pretty straightforward and most importantly, will limit the sort of impact, really mitigate any impact that advice practitioners might otherwise have uh, when ownership changed at their uh, licensee level and, and certainly mitigate any impact on their underlying clients. So it's somewhat of a plug and play. Um, really assisting that process further is uh, we use really all the same technologies. So the key technologies that get applied in the group are uh, at, at a practice level for the advisors is the uh, advice practice software that they use, um, exactly the same that we use across our cohort. So um, our, our advisors across Wealth Today, Century and Synchron will use uh, either X-Plan or Advisor Logic or Midwinter. Um, so we're very used to supporting those processes. We have uh, the knowledge base, the intellectual property within the business to continue to support them. Um, all Millennium 3 practices use uh, X-Plan. So we'll really unplug the X-Plan site from Insignia and, and plug it in on our side. Uh, the other technologies that we'll be bringing across would be um, obviously the revenue management systems. Uh, again, we use exactly the same system uh, within our business that Millennium 3 uses. So really it's just a matter of changing uh, usernames and passwords for, uh, for the staff that are supporting the remuneration uh, system. And exactly the same on the advisor education and training modules. Advisors and their licensees need to track all their continuous professional development points. Um, and we use exactly the same technologies to do that. So pretty straightforward plug and play. Uh, another thing is very kindred in terms of the policy suite that uh, Millennium 3 has been operating. So whilst we think the change for Millennium 3 advisors, we will bring a lot to the table for them as a network and be able to make some exciting changes in their practices over time. In terms of disruption to their business, while we unplug from uh, Insignia and plug, plug back in on our side, we think it'll be seriously mitigated. So uh, that's really good news. All right, I often get asked is uh, what drives revenue within the business for uh, WTL? 
and our revenue was made up of uh, primarily all of the gross revenue uh, across all of the practices. So all of the fees that they're charging, the underlying advisors are charging their clients, um, all of the insurance commissions, both up upfront and recurring commissions that they're collecting, um, the same on the fees they're charging clients when they're doing new statements of advice or new advice for clients, they're charging fees and advisors are charging fees to clients on an ongoing basis to manage their investments and manage their affairs. So all of that gross revenue is collected by us. Um, we also charge all of our uh, practices base fees to be part of the network. Um, and then we share in that practice revenue with them. Um, and then we have a range of user pay services within, within the group because uh, different practices have different levels of support that they need around things like our risk management framework and so on. A new revenue line for us is our licensing and advisor services fees. That's taking those wealth advisor products out to the broader marketplace. And then, of course, we have our B2C revenue. I think one of the key aspects that probably sets us apart from uh, some of our listed peers and, and certainly a number of other advice networks in the country is that um, practice revenue share that we have with um, currently with 300 of our 400 practices um, and, and it will become in adding these new practices in will be 375 of our 475 practices that we'll have a revenue share with and that's a really important feature because um, that really motivates us and aligns our interests um, in, in helping the practices grow both their revenue and their profitability. A quick recap here on our most recent full year results. Um, 2023, our audited results saw us finish with a significant increase in revenue to 162 million, uh, GP up by 54% to 17 million, and our EBIT up uh, or just a little out touch over doubling to 5.6 million net profit after tax um, uh, up 121% to 4.14 million. So there's been a lot of interest in our sector of late and quite rightly so is what we're seeing in Australia is an incredible supply demand imbalance emerge in uh, financial and investment advice and holistic advice and also risk insurance advice. Um, we've seen um, a real decline in advisor numbers as education standards have changed over the last sort of five years and regulation has got more challenging. And we've seen this unraveling of the vertically integrated model where uh, the banks and insurers had um, acquired a lot of the previously privately owned uh, advice networks in the country. And they've kind of unraveled all of that um, in the wake of the Royal Commission. And a lot of the banks have exited their, um, or shut down their salaried advisor divisions as well. So we've had a significant reduction in advisor numbers with uh, advisor numbers dropping by about 10,000 over the last few years uh, to where they sit now at about 15,000. So we're, we're um, and barriers to entry have been set very high. So the new education standards require incoming advisors that, that don't have at least 10 years experience um, to, to, um, uh, uh, to do a four-year degree and then do a professional year. So significant barriers to entry. We've got an ageing advisor population base. So we're seeing a lot of people retiring and selling their businesses. We've got a natural outflow, I'd say, of around about 1,000 advisors a year. And the inflow is only about half of that at the moment. So, you know, look, we're thinking advisor numbers in the next few years might settle um, a little bit below that 15,000, probably as low as 12,000 advisors. So on the supply side, we've had significant reduction in numbers and it's probably going to decline a little bit further. And we've got high barriers to entry preventing sort of a flood of new entrants coming in. So a real chokehold on supply for the foreseeable future, I think. At this same time, the demand for advice and the capacity for people to pay for advice and the complexities around things like superannuation laws keep increasing. So people need more advice. And if you have a look at what's happened with the Australian population just in the last few years, between the last two censuses, I think the Australian population grew by about 8%. During that same period of time between 2016 and 2021, the retiree market 65 plus grew by a staggering 19.1%. So, and the pre-retiree market's growing significantly as well. 
At that same time is we've seen median household incomes increase 24%. Um, household incomes, uh, households with more than $3,000 a week of weekly income has jumped from 16.5 to, uh, to, to around one in four. So we've got this wall of people coming towards retirement. We've got um, increased household income in those key cohorts um, increasing significantly. So the capacity to pay for advice uh, has improved. Most significantly, look, the key, the key uh, asset or capital pool that advisors in Australia advise on is superannuation assets. So we've seen superannuation assets now pass $3.5 trillion. And what's driving that growth is uh, we've got incredible statutory inflows and voluntary inflows into super of more than $2 billion a week, some $2.3 billion each and every week um, gets uh, uh, deposited into superannuation accounts. Of course, we've got outflows, which is people that are in retirement, either, either going into pension drawdowns or taking lump sums out. So that, that sees about $1.7 billion a week of outflow. But at the same time, we've got $1.3 billion a week on average of asset growth inside super. So this all nets down to a, a, an incredible $2 billion a week or just short of $2 billion a week of net growth in superannuation assets. Um, we're at 3.3. I think that these numbers are from December last year. I think you'll see we've gone through 3.5 trillion now uh, in terms of that that uh, that capital pool that's been advised that uh, is there to be advised on. So what we've got is we've got a wall of people coming into retirement that's not stoppable. You know, this is the baby boomers that are all coming as a as a real weight of numbers into retirement now. Um, they're needing transition to retirement advice, retirement advice, aged care advice. Um, we're seeing an intergenerational wealth transfer as well. And uh, I, I've often talked in the past of the inter intergenerational wealth transfer, as I think the pundits are suggesting that there's some 3.5 trillion or more of assets about to pass from one generation to the next over the next 10 to 15 years. And I talk to advisors about this often, and sometimes I see their eyes glaze over thinking that, because what they're thinking is, oh my goodness, you know, the millennials are all getting this money and I'm not used to dealing with younger people in my practice. I'm used to dealing with people that are setting themselves up on the, you know, immediate runway to retirement and or that are in retirement. The reality of it is it's not the millennials getting that money. The baby boomers are passing the money to the Gen Xs and they're right on the doorstep of retirement themselves and many of them entering retirement now. So it's the key cohort that advisors are used to dealing with and comfortable uh, uh, dealing with. So there's definitely opportunities for advisors to continue to look at ways of um, you know, building systems and processes that are more targeted at the millennials and beyond. But right at the moment, we've got this incredible supply demand imbalance of um, retirees, the retiree numbers growing, the pool of capital growing, the transfer of capital from one generation to the next. It really is an incredible time for advisors at, at a time when those advisor numbers, and uh, as I mentioned before, down to 15,000 and probably headed a bit lower. So a lot of surveys get done on what Australia's uh, preparedness is uh, to pay uh, for financial advice. And you might've come across things written by ASIC or advisor ratings in the past that say a lot of Australians just don't rate the value of advice. But the reality of it's this, significantly, significant numbers do. You know, one in 20 Australians is prepared to pay uh, between two and a half thousand and five thousand dollars a year ongoing for advice. Um, one in 40 is prepared to pay more than five thousand uh, dollars for advice. And when we look at the people paying more than five thousand dollars a year for advice across our cohorts, as we see an average that they're paying of about seventy five hundred dollars. So all of this nets down in a reduced advisor pool um, to a fee preparedness that would see advisors just on an ongoing basis be averaging uh, better than $400,000 per annum each. Um, that's actually about what advisors are doing at the moment, but they're doing it at, um, somewhere between that sort of $350 and $450 on average each in, in gross revenue. They're doing that inclusive of all of their upfront fees, inclusive, inclusive of upfront insurance commissions and ongoing trail insurance commissions. 
in these numbers I'm just talking about ongoing fees. So we see that over the next few years, we we think any advisor that's not targeting getting towards that six fifty seven hundred thousand dollars on average. That's for every you know young old in between not just practice principles, but on average, every advisor in this country should be targeting that. So we see significant growth opportunity in practices. And that at that same time, that will run for um, businesses like ours that work with those advisors to help them deliver those sorts of outcomes. And look, where we land in those sorts of numbers is with the, with the average advisor just needing to deal with about 88 clients, which is even less than what they're dealing with now. So, um, fantastic supply demand imbalance that doesn't address a societal problem that's emerged in Australia, which is that um, the changes to the framework, whilst very good for advice practitioners and networks like ours from a revenue and profitable profitability perspective, um, those changes that have emerged, the reduction in advisor numbers, um, this is a societal problem that, you know, the government's working hard to fix now for those sort of lower balance clients trying to come up with ways to remove some of those barriers to entry for um, people providing transactional or episodic advice. And we see some exciting opportunity there if the government uh, gets the framework right for um, pra practices like those in our networks to develop technology solutions and so on for those, um, uh, those lower value clients. But right for now, in the next few years, within the current regulatory framework, um, it's what I would term halcyon days for uh, for advisors. All right, um, quick uh, note here on our board. Oh, I see we've um, we've already taken Michael Harrison out, uh, but uh, myself, Guy Headley, and Chris Kalesis are all sort of founding directors of the company. Guy is our chairman. Chris um, started the business with me back in 2010. Um, Michael Harrison, uh, one of our non-executive directors. Uh, tomorrow we have our AGM, and Michael is stepping down. So. I think Jane's pulled him out of the uh, the slide, jumped the gun. But um, uh, Michael uh, has made a great contribution to the business, so uh, we thank him for that. Um, he's off to focus on uh, his his many other private uh, uh, business opportunities that he's got before him. And uh, we announced a, a a few weeks ago that we're delighted to have Chelsea Pottinger. Uh, uh, joining our board. So she will uh, join the board with effect from after the AGM tomorrow when, when Michael comes off. Um, a really experienced team in David Newman, uh, Jack Standing, Frank Paul and, and Rickton Jones, our, our key executive team, our two joint chief operating officers, uh, Frank Handling, uh, been at the group head of risk um, and Jack, a group head of advice and David Newman, our other joint COO based over in our Perth office, um, uh, really been the uh, the key lead on our advisor relationship management and Rickton Jones, our group head of finance. Um, our management team, um, a really experienced team of, of regional managers that are the core interface into supporting practices in their practice management and revenue and profitability development in Ben Donahue, Sarah Congdon, Emma Crothers, uh, Bernie Fernandez, Danny Marr and, and Tony Pelosi. Um, here's the Millennium 3 uh, frontline uh, management team that uh, are coming across. Uh, I'll start with Helen Blackford, incredibly experienced uh, financial services executive. Helen is the outgoing CEO of M3, uh, but uh, I'm delighted to say she's uh, uh, she's agreed to uh, stay with us throughout the transition while we um, get the M3 network plugged into the WTL network and get everything operating smoothly. So. Um, very happy to have Helen helping with the transition there. And then each of Liana Martin, Dennis Kramer, uh, Justin Baratta and Sonia Bigler have all been with M3 for a long period of time. And we're delighted that they'll all be coming across to continue helping us manage those relationships and support the advisors in the M3 network um, as, as they come across under the, uh, uh, the WTL banner. And um, I think that brings us about to the conclusion Oh, no, we've got one more. Um, for those of you that don't know our business, a quick summary of uh, our top shareholder base. Really, uh, WTL is a founder-led and board and management have a, a significant um, uh, position in the company with accounting for about 32% of the company. Um, and then importantly, our institutional shareholders in uh, UIL uh, Limited, Ariadne, IFM and Glenn and Small Companies 
all very experienced financial services investors that um, have really backed the company and backed management's strategy in this space. They all understand the financial advice network space and they all see the opportunity in the long term and immediate term, but also the long term um, uh, because of this incredible supply demand imbalance that we've talked about. So uh, a very good register of committed shareholders, both in terms of uh, the executive and management and board and uh, and also our key institutional shareholders. So now I think that brings us to conclusions. Jane, if we've um, got any questions that have popped up, um, that would be fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. And um, encourage webinar attendees to use the Q&A function, which can be found at the bottom of your screen. Uh, let me jump into them though, Keith. So uh, where are the M3 practices located geographically? Yeah, good question, Jane. Uh, a, a pretty diverse spread is there's there's probably a slightly disproportionate number up in Queensland, but um, uh, otherwise spread across uh, all the eastern seaboard states and uh, also uh, uh, some in um, uh, some in South Australia and and some in uh, some in Perth. So uh, look, we've uh, those of you that know the company will know that we've our head office is here in Sydney. Um, but also we've got uh, an office in uh, in Melbourne. We've got an office in in Perth. Uh, we've got a significant number of advisors in in Western Australia because both the Wealth Today cohorts um, and also the Century cohorts started in in Western Australia. So um, yeah, we've got a significant number of staff over there as well. So we've got offices in those three capital cities, um, and then we've we've got. Um, uh, staff in in South Australia and staff up in in Queensland. So um, we've we've got the personnel spread right across the country to support the practices that are that are spread pretty evenly across the country. Thank you, Keith. That leads me to the next question. So, how many staff are you taking on from Insignia? Yeah, good. Well, so there, there's those uh, four frontline regional managers and then three support staff. So, um, and of course, Helen in that interim period to help us manage it across. So um, this is this has been, a um, again, one of the key benefits for us is, um, you know, there's, we haven't had to make any redundancies associated with it because of that plug and play nature of, of being able to unplug from Insignia and, and plug in on our side. So, um, pretty seamless transition and del and delighted to be having those experienced M3 people come across with us. Wonderful. And you mentioned in, in the presentation that the CEO of M3 is going to be staying on. So how long is that going to be for? Look, um, Helen's been terrific. She said as long as or as little as you need, she's got, um, you know, she feels very emotionally about her M3 advisors. She's been with the business for, for a considerable amount of time. And I think it's been a key thing, actually, um, we were delighted that Insignia approached us with this acquisition uh, and, and asked us to look at it and, and run the slide rule over it and, and see if we could make it work in terms of um, bringing the business on board because everybody there, not just Helen, but also the, the Insignia people were very concerned that the, that the network end up um, uh, at a good place um, and, and within a network where they would feel comfortable and, and feel like they were going to get well looked after. So, and that's very important for Helen. So um, it, it'll be at least for several months while we, um, while we get the transition all organised. Thank you, Keith. This one's come through a few times. So are you going to keep making further acquisitions? Well, I think last time we did one of these, Jane, I, I had a similar question, uh, maybe when we did the results presentation, if we we're going to keep making acquisitions. And I said that it was no longer part of our corporate strategy because what was really driving acquisitions for us to start with was ensuring that we had the right scale in place to be able to underwrite a really diverse range of services for advisors. And we had determined that you probably needed 300 plus advisors to be able to properly underwrite all the sorts of things that advisors need. Now, there's core services, obviously, that advisors need to access every day, every week or every month. But there's certain things that they need and only once every six months or 12 months or sometimes not for a year or two, unless you've got the right sort of scale. But when they need access to those, they need it now. And that might be things like dispute resolution services with their clients. You know, disputes with clients arise from time to time. Nothing worse than being part of a practice 
that uh, part of a group that doesn't have the the, the hands-on personnel and experience to deal with that when it arises. And so there's all these key things like that that you need a certain amount of scale for. But having completed the Synchron acquisition last year, we were very comfortable that we'd reached that point. And so what I had said is it was no longer part of our strategy, although if the right opportunities arose, we would we would look at them. And this was certainly one of those. So I guess I go back to that default position. It, it's not a driving force in terms of our corporate strategy, um, but certainly we'll, if, if, um, if opportunities arise, uh, we'll continue to look at them. Thank you, Keith. Uh, so another one here, there's been a lot of corporate activity in the space recently. So what do you think is driving this? And then secondly, where do you see WTL fit into this landscape? Um, there has been a lot of corporate activity. I think we saw um, Diverger with a, a, an unsuccessful indicative non-binding offer for uh, for a Centrepoint Alliance last year. We saw um, uh, we saw uh, Count more recently come out and agree uh, to acquire Diverger, and then we uh, saw a counter bid from um, uh, from someone else who's now emerged on the register of um, uh, of Diverger. So, and and we've had this transaction obviously, and and uh, Aussie Unity sold their their advice uh, business last uh, last week or a couple of weeks ago to um, uh, to Fortnum, a, a privately owned business. Look, what's driving it is I think um, everybody's recognising that opportunity that we saw back in 2018. And and that was uh, people, quite frankly, some of them accused us of being a bit crazy at the time as the, as the banks were exiting the space and some of the insurers were exiting the space as we, we got, uh, you know, politely accused of running into a burning building. And, but we, we wanted to be counter cyclical because in our estimation, advisors needed to to see their networks return to the state that they've been previously which has been sort of owned and or operated by people that were practitioners themselves that understood what it was like to sit in a room with clients every day and what it was like to run a practice every day and so uh, I think um, all that activity that's going on now our own included is people seeing the opportunity that um, advisors need that um, they're looking for um, the right level of service and supports from their networks. And then we've got that incredible supply demand imbalance that I was talking about. So um, we're just, we're delighted to, you know, see the activity in the space and, and see a bit of interest in, uh, in the sector. It's, uh, it's very encouraging. Wonderful. So next one, um, I've read an article saying that M3 advisors have clients invested in a lot of insignia products. Do you have to commit to leaving that money with them? Uh, good, yeah, good question. Um, but the answer to that is no. There's, there's certainly been, there's certainly no form of commitment that we've had to make to that. As advisors, um, advisors in our network, and I think just about most networks these days are, uh, are free to deal with, and certainly within our network, we, we advise a choice in terms of the sorts of investment products and platforms that they use for their clients is absolutely critical. So no, there's no contractual commitment, but I, I, I would imagine, you know, Insignia has got a great ra range of both sort of investment um, platforms, uh, systems, investment management systems, and, and they've also got a great range of sort of investment products and, and investment mandates across things like separately managed accounts and model portfolios and so on. So um, I it, excluding M3 is, um, you know, Insignia has got pretty good penetration across our advice practices as well. So uh, absolutely no requirement to be there, but I, I wouldn't see any reason that advisors um, uh, wouldn't be continuing to uh, support that where, they're, uh, where they have been in the past. Oh, somebody's asked here whether we, number one, whether we were increasing our debt to, to out or capital and number two, if we were... Um, uh, how we were funding the acquisition. So we will. The intention is just to fund the acquisition out of cash, um, and no, we we don't have an intention to um, uh, to increase um, uh, to increase our debt. Okay, wonderful. Well, if we have missed any of your questions, please feel free to reach out by the contact details on the bottom of our ASX releases. But uh, thank you again for joining us. Thanks, Jane, and thanks everyone.